a priest and a rabbi who are really good friends. They've been friends for years. And part of their friendship is that they'll often sort of deba debate each other or attempt to convince each other of the validity of the opposing religion. And so the rabbi is always trying to convince the priest why he should convert to Judaism and so on and so forth. And one day these two friends are driving along in a car and they, they get involved in a pretty serious car accident. And so far they go off the road and, and, and kind of are knocked unconscious. And, um, and the priest is, is coming to, and as he looks across the way at the rabbi, he sees him make the sign of the cross. And, and he's like, whoa, and, and he passes back out from, from the pain. And so when they're in the hospital together and they're beginning to heal up and, and the priest eventually says to the rabbi, he says, I knew it. I knew in your heart you always knew that, that, that my religion was true. And, and the rabbi's like, what are you talking about? And he's like, I saw you. I saw in like a moment when you feared for your life and you thought you were going to meet your maker, that you were making the sign of the cross. And the rab rabbi thought for a second and he's like, I wasn't making the sign of the cross. I was checking all the essentials, spectacles, testicles, wallet, and watch. <laughs> you, you, you don't want to lose your spectacles. Um, <laughs> My, my 92 year old grandpa told me that joke, just <laughs> if we're looking for someone to blame. Um, our movie clip this morning uh, comes from a familiar movie. Many of you may know it. Uh, it's a scene from Forrest Gump. And it depicts this, this moment when Forrest and his good friend, Lieutenant Dan are running a shrimp boat and they find themselves in the midst of a severe storm that is threatening to, to ultimately to sink them. And it's in the midst of this, this terrible storm that Lieutenant Dan has this confrontation with God. His, his issues with God are sort of put on full display. And just kind of as a disclaimer here, there's, there's, there's a swear word, which normally we would bleep in, in this, but this we're leaving it uh, this morning because it's, it's really part of Lieutenant Dan's very kind of raw, honest prayer conversation with God. And so um, check this out and then we'll go from there. Lieutenant Dan, what are you doing here? Well, thought I'd try out my sea legs. But you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dang. <laughs> yes, I know that. You wrote me a letter, you idiot. Well, well, Captain Forrest Gump. I had to see this for myself. <laughs> and I told you if you were ever a shrimp boat captain that I'd be your first mate. Well, here I am. I am a man of my word. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but don't you be thinking then I'm gonna be calling you sir. No, sir. It's my boat. <laughs> I have a feeling if we head due east, we'll find some shrimp, so take a left. Take a left. Which way? Over there. No shrimp, Lieutenant Dang. Okay, so I was wrong. Well, how are we gonna find them? Well, maybe you should just pray for shrimp. Still praying at so I went to church every Sunday. Sometimes Lieutenant Dang came too, though I think he left the praying up to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
tramp. Where the hell's this god of yours? It's funny Lieutenant Dan said that, because right then, God showed up. <laughs> through here yesterday destroying nearly everything in its path and as in other towns up and down the coast biola battery's entire shrimping industry has fallen victim to carmen and has been left in utter ruin speaking with local officials this reporter has learned in fact only one shrimping boat actually survived the storm louise louise that's forced after that shrimping was easy <laughs> Since people still needed them shrimps for shrimp cocktails and barbecues and all, and we were the only boat left standing, Bubba got shrimps what they got. We got a whole bunch of boats, 12 jennies, big old warehouse. We even have hats that say Bubba Gump on Bubba Gump shrimp. It's a household name. Hold on there, boy. Are you telling me you're the owner of the Bubba Gump Shrimp Corporation? Yes, sir. We got more money than David Crockett. <laughs> Boy, I heard some whoppers in my time, but that tops them all. <laughs> we were sitting next to a millionaire. <laughs> well, I thought it was a very lovely story. And you tell it so well with such enthusiasm. Would you like to see what Lieutenant Dan looks like? Well, yes, I would. That's him right there. <laughs> and let me tell you something about Lieutenant Dan. Forrest. I never thanked you for saving my life. He never actually said so, but I think he made his peace with God. This morning we are in session 18 of Team, and we're we've been a part of this series um, dealing with the questions that every man asks. And uh, and today the question is, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? The question of of sovereignty. And this scene that we just watched, it begins with, um, with Lieutenant Dan asking for us, where's this God of yours? Um, and then it proceeds to this really honest sort of raw exchange where he's just yelling out, it's just you and me, come and get me. And the resolution comes in, in the end as he says he's made his peace with God. And as we've been looking at the story of Job over the last two weeks, there's a lot that relates here. Last week, Pastor Brian was dealing with the question, why do bad things happen to good people? The question of unjust suffering. And as you work your way through this story, um, if you're anything like me, I have felt frustrated at times because you feel like there's a little bit of a lack of resolution. Um, the first time I saw the movie, uh, The Fellowship of the Rings, the first of the Lord of the Rings, I was a little bit unfamiliar with the story and I didn't realize that it was a trilogy. 
So I went to the movie and after three hours, it ends with like two hobbits walking off kind of towards this ominous scene and then goes to black and the credits come up. And I thought that's the dumbest movie I've ever seen, right? Because there's a complete lack of resolution when you don't know how things end, when you don't realize that, that the story isn't resolved in a way that feels right and justified to us. So after everything that Job endures, the story concludes now with, with God meeting Job in the midst of his suffering and sorrow. And I think Job, like the rest of us, hope for an explanation. Like, I, I want to get a bigger sense of, of why suffering is allowed to happen. And you want to think, wrap your heads around the ultimate good that will result from it. I want it all to make sense, and I want to be able to see the bigger picture. I, I want some sort of justification to Job's experience, and I want to believe that my own experiences of pain, although absolutely trivial in comparison to Job's, and even the suffering that you and I see in the world that's unfolding around us, I want to believe that somehow it's, it's reasonable, it's explainable, and ultimately that it's fixable. I, I want to be able to answer the question of why and be reassured of the what that is, is coming. It's worth noting here that, that very few of us could ever claim to have endured the sort of affliction that we see unfold in the life of Job. He has lost everything. However, I think most of us can relate to some point of suffering and the subsequent pain and all the emotions, the anger that naturally come with it. In fact, over the 20 years that I have been a, a pastor, it's been my experience that for some people, their most poignant encounters with God come in the results or in the midst of pain and suffering. And I would say that the same is true for myself, that in my own faith journey, that I have been challenged and changed through the fear and the vulnerability that accompanies pain. And so now here's Job. After listening to his friends, like the central portion of this book is, is his friends gathering around him, basically explaining why there must be a correlation between his suffering and some sort of sin. And Job is constantly defending himself. As a matter of fact, Brian, I think, alluded to this last week, but when Job's friends first arrive, they just sit with him for seven days in silence, just mourning with him. And that's when they're at their best. It's when they begin to speak as if they understand things that, that they really do more harm than good in the life of Job. Job ultimately rejects their theory that this is some sort of divine punishment. And, and he begins to sort of desire his day in court. He wants to make his case for his innocence, and, and he wants to be a, a judgment on God's treatment of him. And so God now grants his request. Job's hope for opportunity to stand before God is realized, and this is where we enter the scene this morning in our passage. This is from Job 38. This is a bit of a longer passage, and then a little bit of chapter 40 as well. Let's read this. He says, Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. He says, Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you. Then you shall answer me. I think any time God starts by saying, brace yourself like a man, uh, you should be prepared. <laughs> it says, where were you when I laid the foundations, the earth's foundations? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? Or what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstones while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Who shut up the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb, when I made the clouds its garments and wrapped it in thick darkness, when I fixed the limits for it and set its doors and bars in place, when I said, this far you may come and no farther. Here is where your proud waves halt. Have you ever given orders to the morning or shown the dawn its place, that it might, be, that it might take the earth by the edges and shake the wicked out of it? The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. 
The wicked are denied their light, and their upraised arm is broken. Have you ever journeyed to the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been shown to you? Have you seen the gates of the deepest darkness? Have you comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. What is the way to the abode of light and where does darkness reside? Can you take them to their places? Do you know the paths to their dwellings? Surely you know, for you are already born. You've lived so many years. And later in Job 40, the Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. And then Job answers the Lord and says, I'm unworthy. How can I reply to you? I put my hand over my mouth. I spoke once, but I have no answer. Twice, but I will say no more. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and said, Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. He continues in the same sort of line of questioning. And what immediately strikes me as I read these verses is, is that Job is his desire, his effort to receive some sort of resolution, some sort of explanation for what's happened to him is, is never realized. Matter of fact, God doesn't really address that at all. So the question that we have to ask ourselves then is, what is it that Job is gaining from this conversation, this encounter with God, and how does that shape our own understanding of God specifically or especially when we are in the midst of our own pain and suffering? And I think it begins by understanding the hubris of man. The hubris of man, that's your first point. Have you ever found yourself in a situation when you are just completely in over your head? Where you are, you're in a situation where you've sort of maybe over-evaluated your ability or your confidence. A couple years ago, I was with our students down on a houseboat trip that we do on Bull Shoals Lake, Arkansas. If you've ever been down to that lake, it's just a crystal clear lake. It's perfect for skiing and wakeboarding and all that sort of stuff. And all the students are out there and, and they're wakeboarding and that seems like really cool. And so I'm old and I was like, I'm going to learn this. And, and they take me out on this really nice lake. The guy who runs the camp is this excellent teacher and he teaches me how to wakeboard. And a couple of weeks later, I'm back and I'm with this group of, of youth pastors. We're at this conference up at Lake Geneva, um, which was not a smooth, crystal clear lake. And the guys go out on this really nice ski boat and, and they're like, hey, does anybody want to wakeboard? And I think to myself, well, I know how to wakeboard, right? And so I get out behind the boat and the water is just choppy and, and beaten and time after time. I mean, I could get up out of the water, but as soon as I did, I would hit a wave and just face plant. I did that about four times and like all my youth pastor buddies are, you know, in this boat just watching and laughing. The reality was that I had the ability to do something in ideal circumstances and almost perfect conditions but when it was removed from that, my capacity or my understanding to, to accomplish that very same thing was drastically limited. And this is where Job finds himself. He finds himself in a situation where he's entirely in over his head. Job's, Job's whole interaction, his encounter begins with this understanding. The word hubris is, is just another word for pride, but it's, it's a sort of pride that is smug and arrogant. Frederick Buchner talked about the idea of, of humans studying theology. He says this, he says, Theology is the study of God and God's ways. For all we know, dung beetles may study us in our ways and call it humanology. If so, we would probably be more touched and amused than irritated. Our hopes is that God feels likewise. Buchner's point is that our limitations in understanding God are obvious. See, there's, there's two base assumptions here on display in Job's request to receive an explanation that I believe are, are sort of underlying factors in our own expectations of God. First is the, the assumption that we deserve an answer, and second is that if we received it, we would be able to understand it. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 9 says this way, he says, but who are you, O oh man, to talk back to God? What shall what is formed say to him who formed it? Why did you make me like this? Does the potter have the right to 
make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use. We look at a clip like we saw this morning where Lieutenant Dan is screaming at God and we understand it. It seems reasonable. He lost his legs in a war that was not his idea. Part of us understands his anger and pain, but on an entirely different level, he is, he is addressing someone. He is screaming about his pain to one who is so far greater, so far beyond his ability to comprehend. Someone that he ultimately knows nothing about in order to demand answers. Job's friends think they understand God and the way he operates. They think they know how he works, but they don't, and they're wrong. See, the pride is confronted as God begins to ask Job this series of questions. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Now Job's own limitations are beginning to be exposed here. His lack of knowledge is, is revealed. And this lack of knowledge is in the contrast to the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God, and that's our second point this morning. See, to say that God is sovereign is to acknowledge that he is preeminent in power and authority. He speaks from, from an expanded perspective beyond our limits. And we get this at some sort of human level if you're a parent. Because there's all times, there's always been times as, as dads when we have had to speak into our kids' lives as ones who have a greater perspective, an expanded perspective. I remember when my, my youngest daughter was nine weeks old, she was... Um, contracted RSV, which is like a, a common cold virus, but in a baby that small, um, their lungs struggle to, to, uh, to deal with all the mucus. So she was actually in ICU and, and, and really struggling. And the doctors came to us and said, hey, we need to do a spinal tap because we need to see if there's some other things going on here. She wasn't recovering. And, and, and I knew how, how horrible that would be for this little baby. To, to get this spinal tap. But I also understood what was at stake. And the fact they said this is sometimes so painful that the screaming is, is so loud that we're going to ask you to go down the hall so you don't have to hear this. And like, that's a difficult decision. That's a difficult place for a father to be put in where you're going to make this decision about your kid that's going to be so incredibly painful to them. And yet you understand that their, their very life may depend on this action. And so you do it. You do it because you have the knowledge and awareness that they lack. See, God's questioning here of Job is not only highlighting or exposing his pride, but more importantly, it's expanding Job's perspective. God reveals to Job all that, that he lacks in knowledge. All that he lacks ultimately resides perfectly in him. So on a base level, as we begin to discover the challenges or the lack of understanding is, is ultimately born out of our own limitations. It's the inevitable result of you and I as the finite trying to understand the infinite. And there's a gap. Our limitations are in stark contrast to the one who is without limits. And God continues to do this in a couple of ways. And in addition to expanding Job's understanding of, of God as one who is without limit, he also expands his, his understanding of God's scope. He says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Pain, pain and suffering of this, this ability to focus our perspective on the immediate on what's happening in the here and now, but God reminds Job that he is operating from the perspective of eternity past and he can look forward to eternity future. You see, to say that God is sovereign is to recognize that he sees all that's led up to this point and all that will transpire going forward. And I think perhaps most importantly, Job's growing awareness of God's sovereignty provides an expanded purpose. This line of questioning, God is ultimately revealed as the one who is the great sustainer. Life, when it is 
going well for us has this tendency to lull us into a false sense of of control but God now expands Job's understanding to the point where he discovers that control lies entirely with him in fact the control that Job believed he once held that that you and I can falsely assume in our lives are in fact entirely out of our domain see to acknowledge that God is the one who is sovereign is to acknowledge that God is God and we aren't. God knows and understand things, and we don't. Job discovers that God is sovereign over all creation. As the one who is sovereign over all creation, God is sovereign over him. And ultimately, then this results in the humbling of man. The humbling of man. And that's our third point this morning. Now God has spoken. But once again, what is remarkable here is that the questions that Job sought to have answered remain largely unaddressed. In fact, there is this obvious sort of missing, uh, this avoidance of the themes of injustice and, and suffering that have been central throughout the course of the entire story. Job has asked God to either bring a charge against him or to identify the sin that's caused this or to give him a venue where he can prove his innocence. But God does neither. What is outstanding is the fact that, that Job, at the conclusion of all of this, is satisfied. He is content. God has met Job in his misery, expanded his perspective. He's humbled him. And for Job, that is enough. When I was a high school student, I had the opportunity with uh, a basketball team that I played on to travel to Europe and we did these evangelism things and, and, and one day we were in Rome and we had the opportunity to visit St. Peter's Basilica and, and there's just this, as you know, there's this incredible art that is there. And one of the most just um, incredible pieces that I saw was this mosaic. Um, it's hard to imagine ever, anyone ever being able to see this and put this together. And if you've ever seen it or seen a mosaic like it, you understand that it's just thousands upon thousands of pieces of broken tile and glass positioned just so in order to make up a, a larger picture. And it's interesting because if you, if you go in and you sort of look at the individual pieces of tile and glass, there's very little beauty about them. In fact, they're very rigid and have sharp edges and and you would look at those things and they would be um, sort of uneventful in and of themselves and yet when it's put together and you step back and you see the entire picture and you see the beauty that the artist created it's breathtaking and what's amazing about this whole scene that's unfolding here in Job is Job is saying God step back let me see the big picture and God never gives that to Job he never answers it in that way. But what he does give him is greater insight into who the artist is. See, this is what Job gains. He doesn't know how his piece of tile fits into the big picture, but he begins to trust and understand the one who is shaping it. This is the end of Job. This isn't in your books. This is in Job chapter 42. But I wanted to read this to you because this is Job's ultimate conclusion. He says, I know that you can do all things and that no purposes of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear and I will speak. I will question you and you will make it known to me. I have heard you, heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent and dust in ashes. You see, Job's ultimate conclusion, his response is a response of humility. After Job has been systematically exposed for what he lacked, God now restores him with the knowledge that he is the one who is sovereign. What Job does not know, God knows. What he cannot do, God does. And what, who he cannot be, God is. See, ultimately, Job discovers that there is a creator who designed him. 
who is great beyond measure and bigger than the mind's ability to conceive. That there is a divinely infinite one who sees all that has been and all that will be. That there is a loving sustainer who, who holds all things in his hands, who is good and who does not abandon man to their own devices. And there's an able father who reminds him that all things are under his control. And for, for Job, this is enough. This became enough. We're going to discuss these questions this morning around our table. First off, we want to look at, uh, uh, does it surprise you that Job speaks so harshly, or that God speaks so harshly to Job despite all that he suffered? Why or, or why not? And then second, can you point to a time in your life when you have been humbled before the sovereignty of God. I'd be interested for you guys to share experiences when you've discovered or seen firsthand for yourselves that God is sovereign, what that looked like for you, and what the impact of that was on you. I'll come up in, in a few moments and, um, and, and bring us into our prayer time together, but for now, you feel free to grab another cup of coffee, some donuts, and we'll dive into these questions together.